I'm going to be discussing my two books, Defending the Undefendable, Defending the Undefendable 1, and Defending the Undefendable 2. But first, let me tell you a little story about how I came to write this one. What happened was I was doing my PhD dissertation at Columbia on rent control, and most of it was on math and stat, and I am very bored by math and stat. So I had to keep pushing. There was a war in Vietnam going on and my choice was either do my dissertation and stay in school or go and shoot some people and be shot by them. I decided to stay in New York and do my dissertation, but I had to give myself a reward. So every time I finished doing one more set of equations, I promised myself I would take one whole day off and I could do anything I wanted. And what I decided to do is to write something. I'm a nerd, you know, so, you know, that's, that's uh, my pleasure to write stuff. And I would write on, I don't know, uh, to pick somebody out of, the, out of my table of contents, the speculator, or the fat capitalist pig employer, or maybe the blackmailer. And then I'd go back to my dissertation, and then uh, I'd have another week off, or a day off in, a, in another week, and I'd write another article. And by the time I finished my dissertation, I uh, had about 30 articles floating around, and I put them together, and that's this book. So I'm uh, very grateful for my PhD dissertation. Boring as hell, but at least it created, uh, or helped me create this. So what I'm going to do is uh, read the table of contents of each of these two books and then maybe talk about one or two of the issues. And as I read them off, write down which issue that you would like me to talk about so that I can talk about the ones you want. Um, okay, so in the first book, um, here are the the chapters under sex, the prostitute, the pimp, and the male chauvinist pig, under medical, the drug pusher and the drug addict, under free speech, the blackmailer, slanderer, libeler, denier of academic freedom, advertiser, and one of my favorites, the person who yells fire in a crowded theater. Then under outlaw, there's the gypsy cab driver, the ticket scalper, and the dishonest cop. Dishonest cop. Under financial, it's the non-government counterfeiter, the miser, inheritor, money lender, and non-contributor to charity. Ayn Rand would like that one, I guess. Under business and trade, the curmudgeon, slumlord, ghetto merchant, speculator, importer, middleman, and profiteer. Under ecology, the strip miner, litterer, and waste maker. And under labor, the fat capitalist pig employer the scab, the rate buster, and the employer of child labor. By the way, this book came out in 1976. My dissertation was finished in 72, so it took me, it takes a while to get a publisher when you're starting out, it took me a while. Um, I want to read what Hayek wrote about this, and when I saw this letter, I asked different people to write a, a I don't know, a blurb for the book, and when I read this, I thought Hayek was drunk. Uh, here's what Hayek said. Looking through Defending the Unoffendable made me feel that I was once more exposed to the shock therapy by which more than 50 years ago the late Ludwig von Mises converted me to a consistent free market position. In other words, he's comparing me to Mises. <laughs> I was just a young punk kid. Uh, not that I'm any Mises now, but you know th that was ridiculous. I was like in my late 20s. And I, I really thought he was a little drunk on this. Later on, what happened is um, I got a hold of his book, The Road to Serfdom, and I wrote a blistering attack on it because I thought he was selling out on principle. And in that, I said, I hate to be like the, what is it, the, the dog that bites you? No, that's not, the, the person who bites the dog. <laughs> Sorry? Bite the hands of Fiji. Thank you. <laughs> I'm getting senile, I'm, I'm losing it here. You can see pretty soon I'll be drooling, so the people in the first row, you better, you better watch out for the drool. Uh, 
biting the hand that feeds you. I felt sort of awkward in criticizing a guy who fed me this magnificent blurb. And then I realized uh, that a good professor, a good scholar is after the truth. And if you don't have it, and one of your students or followers, as I am of Hayek, I mean, I revere him as an Austrian economist. I think that as a libertarian, he's a little not as good as he should be. But I think that that's the ideal, that we professors want to get to the truth with a capital T if possible. And if we don't, and if one of you students can set us straight, that's good. We shouldn't resent it. We should uh, glorify that. In my talk on uh, Friday on Murray Rothbard, I will be talking about Murray in this regard and how he uh, reaches the highest levels of just this sort of a thing, of welcoming criticism from his followers. Okay, so that's the, the first book. Um, the second book, uh, this one came out in, uh, what year? 2013, so it's a, a long time between 76 and 2013. I've now got Defending the, th uh, the Undefendable Three in I'm sort of halfway through it, but I keep getting distracted. I'm like the, the girl who can't say no. Uh, you know, people ask me to do this, and I say, oh, yeah, that's fun, and I'll do that. And so one of these years, I'll come out with Defending Three. In the, and if anyone has suggestions for what's not on these lists that need to be defended, please uh, send me stuff, get my email, and say, hey, you should include this person in, in Defending Three. OK, so here's Defending Two. Under trade, multinational enterpriser, the smuggler, British Petroleum, nuclear energy, and the corporate raider. Under labor, the hatchet man, the home worker, the picket line crosser, the daycare provider, and the automator. Under medical, the smoker, the human organ merchant, that's the person who buys and sells used body parts, the breast milk substitute purveyor. Under sex, topless in public, Polygamous marriage and the burning bed, that's about uh, wife abuse, where the wife kills the abusive husband. The discriminators, the sexist, the peeping Tom, the ageist, the homophobe, and the stereotyper. These are all people who discriminate. And by the way, two books have come out at, uh, on the basis of defending the undefendable. One of them is called The Case for Discrimination, and the other on uh, a topic in this book is uh, legalizing blackmail. So I'll talk about a little bit about discrimination and, and blackmail uh, when I get to doing chapters here. So under discrimination, sexist peeping, oh, uh, sexist, peeping Tom, ageist, homophobe, and stereotyper. In Defending Three, I'm thinking of having um, uh, people who discriminate against those who have uh, too few hair follicles. <laughs> Under business, the war toy manufacturer, the colorizer, the baby seller, baby seller, buying and selling babies. David Gordon will appreciate that one. And the heritage building destroyer. Under politically incorrect, the bad Samaritan, not the good Samaritan. The duelist, person who duels, fights duels. The executioner, the dwarf thrower. Those are people who <laughs> throw dwarfs. Uh, you know, like bowling, you know, you throw a dwarf and, and try to throw them through a basket, whatever, and the intellectual property denier. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take one chapter from this book, and that is blackmail, and one chapter from this book, namely discrimination, and start off with those two, and then maybe pick one or two others from each book, and then uh, hold it open to the audience where you can choose other chapters or pretty much anything else you want to ask me or discuss. OK, so under blackmail, what's going on with blackmail? Now, you'd think blackmail is a very bad thing. And very bad things should be prohibited by law. But libertarianism doesn't prohibit all bad things. Libertarianism is a theory of what law should be. And what it says is you can do anything you damn well please. Just do not initiate violence against other people or their property. So the question is, does blackmail constitute an initiation or a threat thereof of violence against someone else? And my answer is no, it doesn't. 
you have to distinguish between blackmail and extortion. In blackmail, what I'm going to do is threaten to become a gossip. I'm going to go to you and say, aha, I saw you out with uh, somebody else, you're a married person, and uh, you're out with uh, somebody else who's not your spouse, and I'm going to tell your spouse, unless you give me a thousand bucks. That's what blackmail is. It's the threat to become a gossip. But is gossip uh, per se a violation of rights? No. Right? I mean, the only violation of rights is murder and rape and theft or the threat thereof. And to threaten to become a gossip is not to threaten to uh, use violence. Now, extortion is very different. And usually they're conflated. And in the literature, they use the synonyms for each other, which is improper because they're very different. In extortion, what you're threatening is, if you don't give me money, I'll kidnap your kids or I'll shoot you or something like that. So blackmail, it's not nice, but then again, libertarianism is not a theory of niceness or nicehood. It's a theory of we should prohibit things that uh, have uninvited border crossings or uh, trespass, but you're not trespassing on anyone else's property. Look, at least the blackmailer has the decency to come to you and say, give me money and I'll shut up. Whereas if you're in the hands of a gossip, it's game over. The gossip is going to just babble. So if you're going to put people in jail for blackmailing, you should put them in jail even more for being a gossip. And yet that's silly. Gossip is a good thing. Gossip keeps people on the straight and narrow. Gossip is a way of, a non-legal way of uh, making people behave better than they might otherwise be because you're always afraid someone will gossip, yak, yak, yak. So th this is the case in favor not of blackmail, but in favor of legalizing blackmail. And then there's a difference. Uh, look, I, I favor legalizing prostitution. I don't favor prostitution. I have a daughter, I have a, a sister, I have a wife. I wouldn't want any of them to be a prostitute. I don't go to prostitutes. I, I don't think prostitution is a good thing. I think that the much better way of relating male and female, or male and male, or female and female, because you have prostitution all over the place, is through love and, and kindness and, and being friends. But should you go to jail for this? No, because it doesn't violate the non-aggression principle, and prostitution doesn't, and nor does blackmail. What happened was the University of Pennsylvania Law Review had a big, thick uh, um, uh, essay, not a... Uh, an issue of, of the University of Pennsylvania Law Review. And uh, what it consisted of was a whole bunch of very, very famous people arguing as to why blackmail should be legal, uh, illegal. Why blackmail should be illegal. And half of them, and they were very famous people. I think there was, um, uh, I don't know, let me, I can pick out some of the authors here. Uh, some of them are very famous um, um, libertarians. Um, Richard Posner, for example, is one of them. And I think um, Epstein is another one, Richard Epstein, uh, Nozick, uh, a whole bunch of people, and they split. Some of them said it was deontological. That's why blackmail should be illegal. And some of them said, no, 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 it's, um, uh, it's uh, based on utilitarianism, namely blackmail is so bad that we have to prohibit it. Not a one of them said, here's the case for legalizing blackmail. And yet I had written several articles, and I wasn't invited to that, so I, Murray Rothbard used to say, hatred is my muse. You know, you read something, you say, oh, I'm going to get them for this if it's the last thing I do. So this, what this whole book is, is mainly a critique of all of those people who uh, contributed articles to the University of Pennsylvania Law Review saying that blackmail should be illegal, and here's why, and they diverged as to why it should be, but not a one of them made the case that it should be legal. So I, uh, this whole book is just filled with my uh, ranting and raving against those guys, and some of them are very, very, um, uh, I, I read off names that, that are famous within libertarian circles. The others are very famous within legal circles. So that's that book, and that's the, the blackmail topic. Okay, the next one is discrimination. Now remember, libertarianism says you've got to keep your mitts to yourself. You can't grab other people or their property. 
Does that mean that you can't refuse uh, to deal with other people based on their race or their sex or how many hair follicles they have or how tall they are or how short they are or, or how old they are or any sort of discrimination? No. You can discriminate till the cows come home. Now, it might not be nice, but uh, if, if you discriminate, you're not violating their rights because they have no right that you should deal with them. Now, uh, Murray Rothbard has another rule, and his rule is um, people specialize in what they're horrible in. For example, Milton Friedman is sound as a bell on minimum wage, on free trade, on rent control, on, on uh, occupational licensure. I mean, he's really, really good on those things. And what does he specialize in? Money, where he's horrible in. And, and educational vouchers, where he's horrible in. Uh, Happily, there are two people for whom Murray's law uh, of people specialize in what they're horrible in doesn't work, and that's Thomas Sowell and Walter Williams. Now, Thomas Sowell and Walter Williams are warmongers. So from a libertarian point of view, they're not really uh, kosher. They're, they're not really part of our gang. But they hardly ever talk about it. What do they talk about? They talk about discrimination. Now, you might think that racial discrimination is really a bad thing and it hurts people. And what Walter and uh, Thomas do is come up with article after article, book after book, showing that discrimination is innocuous. Namely, what I'm trying to do now is soften you up. Because the usual feeling when you hear about racial or sexual or any kind of discrimination is, oh my god, that's disgusting. It ought to be uh, prohibited by law. Uh, because the, the victims of it are really hurt. And what Walter and Thomas say is, no, 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 they're not really hurt. And what I say in, uh, in this book about uh, discrimination is that they're not really hurt. So let me give you some examples. Let's take the uh, case of uh, the Jim Crow laws where the black people had a ride in the back of the bus. And there was some famous case where some woman refused to give up, a black woman refused to give up her seat to a white man. And, um, uh, there was a big lawsuit about that. The question is, why doesn't some other bus company start up and say, black people, you can ride in the front, you can ride in the back, we don't care where you ride, just, you know, come on to our bus. See, the, the, the solution, the recipe for discrimination is competition. So the question is, why didn't some other company, whether started by a black person or a white person, just somebody who discriminates in favor of green, namely green as in money, because there's profits to be made. Because if black people are told, you can't ride in the front of the bus, you have to go to the back of the bus, uh, they're going to be miffed. And they, they would be ripe for uh, being a, a customer of this new bus company. So why didn't, it, why didn't some other bus company start up in the Jim Crow South in uh, the 1930s or the early 1940s? The reason is because in order to start up a bus company, you had to get permission from the very people who were uh, espousing Jim Crow legislation in the first place. So competition is the solution for this discrimination, but they didn't allow competition, so of course it's going to hurt black people. But if somebody else could open up a bus company, and presumably all black people would go to that one, and some white people, because the, that's the next bus, well then then the whole thing would go away. Take another case. Suppose black people and white people have an equal productivity, and some of them do, and let's say they're each uh, pr uh, productivity is $10 an hour. And due to discrimination, uh, black people only make $7 an hour. Well, what are you going to do if you want to maximize profits? I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to offer $7.01, and I'll make $2.99 pure profit. And somebody else will say 702, and someone else will say 703, and where will it, bid be, where will it be bid up to? To $10. Namely, uh, the discrimination is perilous, and, and it probably wouldn't even go to 7 or 701 or 702 because market forces of competition would, uh, would see to it that this didn't occur. Okay. I've done a little bit on discrimination. I've done a little bit on blackmail. Let me pick one more from this book and one more from that book, and then I'll open it up for discussion, and people hopefully will ask about other chapters, and I'll uh, try to respond to them. So which one shall I pick here? Let me see. Personal yells far in a crowded theater. 
That's one of my favorites. And Justice Holmes uh, was saying that, you know, free speech is all well and good, but there have to be limits. You just can't say anything you damn well please. And by the way, I agree with that. I don't think that all speech acts are uh, legitimate. There are certain speech acts which uh, should be prohibited by law, namely, if you don't give me money, I'm going to kill you. Namely, a threat. It's just a speech act, but I think that that should be prohibited by law. Uh, there has to be some sort of clear and present danger. For example, in a play, if some character says, if you don't give me money, I'm going to kill you, that's OK. Or in the present context, I just said those words, but you all know I'm not going to kill you. I mean, that's just silly. I'm doing a philosophical examination here. But if, I, if it was you know, close in a, a dark alley, and, and you were afraid, and I said that, and you shot me, it would be legitimate defense. Whereas right now, if you shot me for saying that, it wouldn't be. So there has to be some sort of rule of reason here. But still, I'm not an absolutist, uh, absolutist on free speech, because an absolutist on free speech would say, you can say anything you want. OK, back to Justice Holmes, who said, well, we have to have limitations on free speech, because uh, otherwise people will yell uh, fire in a crowded theater, and we can't have that. Well, what's the libertarian answer, as I see it? What is the, this chapter in, in this book all about? It says, look. Um, why can't you yell fire in a crowded theater? Because you're violating the contract. But suppose you had a theater where they wanted to do that. Shouldn't consenting adults be allowed to, uh, to yell fire in a crowded theater and then rush together? I mean, if they all agree to it? <laughs> One of my um, uh, articles talks about this thing called Murder Park. What's Murder Park? It's a, a stadium where the walls are 20 foot thick, and everybody is issued a pistol with six bullets and told that you can shoot anyone else. But wait, when the, the bell rings at 50 minutes of the hour, everybody has to stop. We cart out the dead bodies. We give more ammunition to all the new people. And then you start in again for another 50 minutes. Is this a violation of rights? No. If there are consenting adults, now look, I'm not, I'm not favoring this sort of a thing, and I don't think anything like this exists, but you know, theoretically, if, if people, you know, people want to commit suicide in weird ways, God bless them, so to speak. I mean, <laughs> I'm a devout atheist, so I, I have to say that with uh, quotation marks. But uh, Murder Park and, and yelling for in a crowded theater are on a par. Namely, the reason you're not allowed to yell fire in a crowded theater unless there's a fire is because in the contract, there's an implicit contract that if they don't put it on the back of the little ticket they give you, they probably have it on the wall somewhere. Namely, whenever you go to a movie, the, the, the first five minutes of behave yourself, shut off your cell phone, you know, don't uh, be a pain in the neck to anyone else, don't yell fire in a crowded theater. So that's why you're not supposed to be yelling far in a crowded theater, not because it has anything to do with free speech. And then what Justice Holmes said is, well, you, since you can't yell far in a crowded theater, you can't do this, you can't do that. And little by little, um, uh, the rights of free speech are truncated. OK, let me pick one from, from this book. Let me see which one I shall pick. Uh, the executioner, the death penalty. What I'm now doing is defending the death penalty for murder. Now, a lot of people say that um, we shouldn't have the death penalty. The death penalty is medieval, it's, it's obnoxious, it's no good. Uh, and also, on a pragmatic utilitarian point of view, it doesn't really reduce the murder rate. Both of these claims are wrong, I claim. Let me do the pragmatic or utilitarian first. What happened was a whole bunch of people, uh, economists, did econometric studies, and they uh, divided the 50 states into those states that had the death penalty and those states that didn't have the death penalty, trying to hold constant other things like age of the population, because a younger age uh, would have more murders. I mean, if the average age is 70, you'd have fewer murders than if the average age is 30. And they would try to control for other uh, independent variables in their econometric equations. And then they found no correlation between uh, uh, the uh, death penalty and the murder rate. So they said death penalty doesn't help reduce the murder rate. And that's one argument against the death penalty. 
But then we had a very wise uh, econometrician, a guy who graduated a year or two ahead of me in, uh, at Columbia, and um, uh, Isaac Ehrlich was his name, and he did it a very different way. He, he didn't uh, correlate death penalty states versus non-death penalty states, but rather he correlated execution states versus non-execution states. In other words, there are some states like California, as it happened, was a death penalty state in the sense that death penalty was on the books, but they never executed anyone. So he said, let's forget about whether it's a death penalty state or a non-death penalty state. Let's look at whether they actually execute anyone or not. And then he correlated uh, executions with the uh, murder rate, and he found a very, very statistically significant uh, 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 correlations, which suggest that the uh, execution, not the death penalty status, but executions actually reduce the murder rate. Because, you know, people feel sorry for a guy on death row that he's going to be killed, but what about all the people that are innocent people that are killed by murderers? You, you have to take into both into account if you want to be a humanist. Okay, so much for the pragmatic or the utilitarian. Now let's talk about the deontological or the philosophical or the, the rights-based. Okay, so here's the situation. Uh, what's your name, William? William. I kill William. <laughs> <laughs> and now the question is, is it justified? Uh, have I given up my right to life? or right not to be killed anyway. There's no right to life, but right not to be killed. And my claim is, so here's the situation with death. Uh, here we have before and after, and here's the murderer, and here's the victim. And before the murderer, I'm going to give a smiley face since he's alive, and the victim, I'm going to give an unhappy face because he's dead. Okay, so the murderer kills the victim. Now, suppose we had a machine, a magic machine of the sort that uh, Nozick is always inventing, that if you flip the switch, what happens is you take the life out of the live murderer, and you stick the life force or life into the dead victim, and out they come after you flick this switch, and now the murderer is unhappy because he's dead, and now the victim is now re-enlivened, Namely, I'm now dead, and, and you're, William, you're back now alive. Not just a zombie, but you're actually alive. Would we have a right to use this machine? And the answer is, you're darn tootin'. Right? Because what I did to him is I stole his life. I, I realize I'm being a little poetic here. You can't really steal a life. You can't grab it. But work with me here. Uh, I stole his life. And the first thing that libertarian punishment theory says is, you got to return it. Look, if I stole his TV and they caught me, surely they would make me disgorge the TV I stole from him and give it back to him. Now, libertarian theory, the way I see it, would be a little bit more draconian than that, because if all I did is, uh, uh, from a pragmatic point of view, if all we uh, imposed on me is the obligation to give him back his TV, I'll just keep on uh, stealing because, you know, I don't get caught all the time. And when I get caught, all I have to do is give back what I stole. So the second tooth in the, uh, this two teeth for a tooth theory is I have to give him one of my TVs of equal value. And if I don't have one, then I have to give him the amount of money because that, you know, I have to do, the law has to do unto me what I did unto him. So now I'm giving him two TVs. And the third one is, um, Costs of capture. If after stealing his uh, TV, I went right to the police station, I said, hey, you know, I stole his TV, I'm sorry, Here, here's his TV back. Well, then there are no costs of capture. But if, dirty rat that I am, after I stole his TV, I then hid and, uh, and you guys had to come look for me, well, who's going to pay for all those costs? Me. And fourth, when I stole his TV, I scared him. His feeling of security has been undermined. So what, how are we going to compensate him for that? Go like this, boo? No, we have to make him, me, I'm the thief here, we have to make me play Russian roulette with the number of chambers and the number of bullets proportional to how badly I stole or how badly I scared him. So that would be uh, my view of libertarian punishment theory, which is pretty draconian. You wouldn't have too much theft if we libertarians got in there and, and dealt with criminals. But the very... <laughs> 
But, but the very first thing is you have to give back what you stole. Well, I killed him. I have to give back what I stole from him, his life. So execution is justified. And it, and it has good uh, uh, benefits. Okay, I've now done what I said I would do. I uh, talked, I gave a um, list of the chapters here. I showed two books that came out of this, out of these uh, things here. There was only one little chapter on each here. The, the entire book is sort of a, a discussion of, of what I only discussed in a chapter of 10 pages or so, and I uh, uh, developed it into a book of two or 300 pages. Okay, so now uh, I would like to call on people to ask about another chapter that I didn't cover. Uh, yes, sir, in the front. That's America. Can't hear you. The bad Samaritan. The bad Samaritan. Well, we all know what the good Samaritan is. Good Samaritan, you see somebody on the side of the road who's hurt, and you stop and you help him. The bad Samaritan is someone who goes by and doesn't help. And doesn't have to go like that to the victim, but just doesn't help. There are now good Samaritan laws on the books where if you go by somebody in an accident and you don't stop to help, uh, you can be in violation of the law and be considered a criminal. So what I'm saying is you don't have to do that. Uh, also in this chapter, uh, take the following case. You're drowning, and I've got a, uh, a rope or a rope with a little um, thing to save you, a, 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 a life preserver. And, and I say, I'll flip you the life preserver if you promise to become my slave forever. <laughs> Am I justified in doing that? Yes. It's a market transaction. If you don't like the market, you know, what do they say? If you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. If you can't stand this sort of weird thing, get out of libertarianism or realize you're being incompatible with libertarianism. I tell you, if I were drowning and, and my choice was uh, either drown or be your slave, I'd rather be your slave. At least I'm alive. So it's a little harsh. And it would be nice if the guy with the uh, life preserver and the rope just tossed it in and be a good guy, be a good Samaritan. But suppose he wasn't a good Samaritan. Is he in violation of libertarian law? No. So that would be the, the burden of that chapter. Uh, yes, sir. The miser, not charity. The miser. Well, there are two different uh, chapters. One is the miser and one is the non-contributor to charity because a miser could contribute to charity. He just Now, my favorite miser is um, Scrooge McDuck. Scrooge McDuck, yeah, yeah. <laughs> she's, uh, she's with me on Scrooge here. And what Scrooge does is he gets into his money bin and he swims in it and he throws it up and it falls down on him and he goes, eh, you know, so, <laughs> so he's a miser. Well... Misers are hated. The, the, um, uh, the Keynesians hate misers. Uh, the worst thing you can be is a miser, or if you stick money under your mattress instead of spending it. And the whole idea of um, redistribution from rich to poor from the Keynesians is that the uh, rich have a low marginal propensity to consume. They save a lot, and the poor will spend it all, and spending is good for the Keynesians, not for the Austrians. Well, uh, is what the miser does, is it a violation of libertarian principle? That's, those are the eyeglasses I use for everything. Namely, of anything I ask, is it a per se violation of, of property rights or rights to person? And, and saving money and putting in a money bin and, and swimming in it is not. So it's legitimate and it should be legal. But I try to do more than say it's legal. I try to soften up my readers by saying not only is it le uh, legal, or rather not only should it be legal, but it also has, benef uh, has benefits. What happens when the miser socks away a million dollars? Prices fall compared to what they would have been otherwise. Had he been spending it, the uh, prices would have been bid up a little bit. So if prices fall, then our money is worth more. So the miser is actually a benefactor to all of us. The miser is helping all of us by making our cash balances. It's called the cash balance effect. Namely, uh, what you do is you take money divided by a price index, and the price index falls because the miser is spending less money. Therefore, the, the fraction, money divided by the price index, the, 
denominator falls, so the fraction rises in value. So our money is worth more. So we ought to pat misers on the back. We ought to have ticker tape parades for them. We ought to uh, you know, write a friendly letter to your friendly miser and say, thanks, miser. <laughs> you, you, you the man. You know, you're, you're helping us. You're making our dollars worth more. So instead of denigrating these poor, misunderstood misers, we ought to you know, uh, carry them around on our shoulders and say thank you. OK, now the non-contributed charity, which is a separate uh, chapter in, in this book. Look, I think it's a nice idea to give charity. It's virtuous. People are poor. Uh, they're suffering. Uh, and we're pretty well to do. People are middle class here or upper middle class or whatever, or some of us are very wealthy. It's a nice virtuous thing to do. But that's not the eyeglasses through which I'm looking at this. I'm looking at it through the libertarian non-aggression principle. Suppose you don't contribute to charity. Are you in violation of, of what the law should be? And the answer is no. Now Ayn Rand uh, takes this to a degree that I wouldn't go as far as. Namely, for her, charity is almost a negative, a bad thing. Not quite, but almost. Uh, whereas for libertarians, you know, we don't call libertarian. We're, we're indifferent to that. Look, what's the libertarian view on whether chess or checkers is more libertarian? Or whether vanilla or chocolate ice cream is more libertarian? The answer is... <laughs> It's irrelevant to libertarianism. There, libertarianism is a theory of what is just law. It's not a theory of all of life. Now, a lot of people have a theory of all of life. We don't. As libertarians qua libertarians, we're only talking about what the law should be and what's legal and what's illegal, or what should be legal and what should be illegal. Okay, another chapter. Yes, sir? Peeping Tom. Okay. Now, here we talk about the rights of privacy. Is there a right of privacy? And from the libertarian point of view, right now I'm looking at all of you people, and you people are looking at me. You're violating my privacy, you dirty, rotten kids. You know? <laughs> and I'm violating your privacy. There is no right to privacy. There are only rights to private property. Now, if what I do is I sneak into your house, I'm, I'm uh, guilty of uh, trespass. So. So you don't have a right to privacy, you have a right to private property. Because if we really had a right to privacy, we couldn't look at each other. Um, and in this chapter, what I do is I list every uh, de detective in uh, fiction, you know, like Sherlock Holmes and all those guys. If there truly were a right to privacy, then the, the um, profession of being a detective would be illegal. So do you really want to say that uh, the detectives who look up things and try to follow people to see if they're behaving themselves? I think uh, one of the members of our group here is a detective. And what he does is he, he's not here in the audience. Uh, I won't out him. But uh, uh, what he does, he works for an insurance company. And for the insurance company, there are people that make a claim. Oh, my leg hurts, uh, this, you know, I, I can't do that. And what he does is he follows them around. And he finds out that they're engaging in a marathon. And he takes a picture of them running in the marathon, and then he brings it back to the insurance company. And the insurance company says to the claimant, hey, you know, you say you can't hardly walk. What are you doing running a marathon? Well, the detective violated the privacy of the claimant, the, the false claim of uh, injury, physical injury, so they get money from the insurance company. So uh, if you really believe in the right of privacy, um, we shouldn't have detectives. Now, none of this has anything to do with NSA. Because people will say, well, then the government can uh, um, monitor all of our speeches, all of our cell phones, all of everything we do. No, the government can't do anything. The government can't do squat. Because the government, according to libertarian theory of non-aggression, is a violator. So it's an, in, uh, it's an illicit institution. Plus, they trespass, they force uh, uh, various uh, computer companies to give them information against their will. So I'm not coming out in favor of government eavesdropping or anything like that. Private eavesdropping is different, provided that they don't violate uh, property rights through trespass. Yes? Uh, profiteering. Profiteering. Murray uh, Rothbard uh, had something, uh, there was a calendar, a libertarian calendar, uh, 
people every once in a while put out a libertarian calendar and they have all libertarians uh, on the picture and, and then they have a little saying underneath. And Murray's saying in one of these calendars was, a man's contribution to society is proportional to the amount of profits he makes. Uh, that's not exactly the words he used, but that was the gist of it. The more profits you make, the more you help people. See, the way the Marxists see it is, it's a sort of a fixed pie, and if I get more, you have to get less. No, it's almost the opposite. If I'm making more profit, then I am uh, doing a much better service. Look, suppose I invented the cure for cancer, and I charge 10000 a pill. Would I make a lot of profit? You're darn tootin', I'd make a lot of profit. Would I be doing a great service for a lot of people who are desperate? Yes. Now, suppose I make a better rubber band. My rubber band is better than the actual rubber bands. Don't ask me in what way. I'm not into rubber bands. Will I make a profit? Yeah. Will I make a vast amount of profit? No. Namely, um, uh, in making rubber band profits, I'm making a contribution to society. We need rubber bands. We need better rubber bands than the ones we now have. And I make a modest amount of profit. So the point is, the more profits I make, in the market, that is, uh, the better, more contribution I'm making to society. Now, of course, if the way I make profits is not through giving a better product at a lower price, but rather through crony capitalism, or what the public choice people call rent-seeking. I don't like the phrase rent-seeking, because what's wrong with rent? I mean, there's economic rent, and then there's uh, renting a car or a house. And they use uh, the word rent to depict something pretty despicable, namely going to the government and getting a law passed such that uh, you can't have imports that compete with you or, or something like that, get, getting a favor from government. Now, if that's the source of your profits, then all bets are off. I'm not defending that kind of profiteering. By the way, why don't we have wage earring? I mean, those guys in the NBA and, and the NFL, you know how much money they're making? Wages? I mean, 10 million. 20 million for the best uh, players. Why is there no word wage earring, namely getting too high a wage? Well, they did that with Michael Milken. Michael Milken made uh, 400 million a year as a wage, and then actually people were saying that that wage was too high, but somehow wage earring hasn't caught on because wages are okay, which is silly. I mean, profits, wages, rents, um, interest rates, it's all the same for, for libertarians. But for our friends on the left, somehow profit is evil. But look, every time we do anything, we make a profit, or at least we try to make a profit. Um, what's your name, young lady? Alexandra. Sorry, Deirdre? Deirdra. Uh, Alexandra. She brought that shirt, the very nice white uh, top, and she paid 30 bucks. How much did she value it at? $30 and a penny at least, maybe 50 bucks. So she, dirty rat she is, made a profit of $20 off of the seller. On the other hand, the seller valued that shirt after he had uh, 3,000 of them at, at, a, at a dollar, because he's trying to get rid of them. So he made a profit off of her of uh, $19. So they each exploited each other? No, they, they each helped each other. It was a mutual benefit. They each profited off of each other. And a profiteer is someone who gets a real big profit. Like if she valued that shirt at 5000 then she made a $4,980 profit. So there's nothing wrong with profits if it comes from uh, the free marketplace. The guy in the red shirt? Dishonest cop. Dishonest cop. Okay, what's going on with dishonest cop? Why do I like the dishonest cop? It's all a matter of comparison. Well, that's not true. I was going to say it's all a matter of comparison. You know, I favor Trump over Hillary because I think he's less warmongering, even though he's despicable in many ways, but she's even more despicable, mainly because I think World War III is a, a very bad thing. It can ruin your whole day. <laughs> and, and I think that Hillary is more warmongering-ish than Trump. By the way, I favored um, uh, my man Obama against McCain in 08. I thought McCain was going to drop a nuclear bomb on whoever. And, and, and Obama seemed more peaceful. I mean, the domestic policies are horrible, but war is more important than economics, in my view, as Murray Rothbard and Bob Higgs are forever demonstrating to us. Okay, suppose we have an illegal law, or rather an illegitimate law, 
And the illegitimate law is, if you smoke uh, marijuana, you go to jail. And now a cop catches me. I'm smoking marijuana and he catches me. An honest cop will put me in jail. Do we want an honest cop? No. We want a, uh, a dishonest cop. Now, the good, dis and here we have a hierarchy. The best dishonest cop would say, Block is smoking marijuana. Do it somewhere else where I can't see you. <laughs> or, you know, do it uh, so that I can't catch you. Because if I see you and my sergeant looks over my shoulder, he's going to wonder why I'm not arresting you. That would be the best thing. That's the dishonest cop that we want. Someone who overlooks uh, an Ill illicit law. Or take the law of runaway slaves in 1862. If you caught a runaway slave, you're supposed to return the slave to, um, to the rightful owner. But, you know, we think that slavery, coercive slavery, that is, is illegitimate. And uh, we want a dishonest cop who won't return an innocent slave to the, the master. Well, it's the same thing with, um, with marijuana. So the best dishonest cop would be someone who just looks the other way. But suppose he says, okay, Block, look, if, if I uh, haul you in, uh, it's going to be five years in jail and a fine of 5000 Give me 100 bucks and I'll let you go. Well, which do I prefer? Five years in jail and 5000 or or 100 bucks? I mean, obviously, I prefer 100 bucks. So that would be a little lower level. He's not a nice guy who's letting me go, but, you know, it's just a, a 100 bucks. So that dishonest cop is not as good as this one, but pretty better than the honest cop. So it's that sort of a thing. If there's an illegal law or a law that's contrary to libertarianism, like you can't smoke marijuana. Now, by the way, I don't favor smoking marijuana. I personally don't indulge. Uh, I can understand medical, uh, you know, uh, it helps people with glaucoma and maybe cancer. Uh, but I'm not into recreational drugs, personally. It's just my personal thing. I wouldn't want my children or my grandchildren to do that. I wouldn't want you to people to do that. I don't think it's a good idea. But that's not the libertarian issue. The libertarian issue is, is it a per se violation of a proper law? And, and it's, it's not. Um, you've already had a shot. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, Tom. Well, can I just get, I can't get this machine idea out of my head. The idea that I get that it was a libertarian theory, if you steal something, you've got to give it back. Well, the murderer basically steals the life from the other guy. So if there was some way to suck the life force of the murderer out and return it to the victim, that would be returning what was taken from But given that we, I'm sorry if I'm thick and I'm not getting your point, but given that we don't have this machine and just executing the, the criminal does not result in transferring his life force to the other person, now all we have is two dead people. It just seems like vindictiveness. No one is made whole. Shouldn't he have to instead you know, work for the heirs of the guy instead, right? Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> if, if I were Ayn Rand, what I would do is say, get out. Because <laughs> if you ask a, a difficult question, you know, the, but obviously I'm, I'm just uh, teasing here. Uh, in the chapter, I do say that. I, I can't do the whole chapter. Uh, uh, what I do say is, since we don't have the machine, well, you see, what I'm trying to say is, we can imagine the machine, and if we can imagine the machine, then deontologically, there's nothing wrong with uh, execution. But back to the real world, we don't have the machine. Well, now, who owns the life of the murderer? The heirs of the murderer. May the heir of the murderer, uh, let's say I, I killed William, and he's got a wife and kids and he was their support, and now his wife owns me, and I say she can do with me whatever she wants. One possibility is make me work uh, at hard labor for the rest of my life, fine. Another one is to execute me and charge admission for a public ex execution with tens of thousands of people and make a lot of money. Does she have a right to do that? I say yes, because my life is forfeit, as shown by the machine. So it's not just that we'll have two dead people. Now, obviously, when the government does it, you know, government schmoverment. But the point is, my life is forfeit. His wife or sister or mother or whoever it is, uh, if, he does, if he's not married, whoever his heir is, is now the owner of my life to do with which as she will. And one of the things she could do is execute me and make money on it because, you know, uh, the breadwinner is now gone. So I, I have that in the rest of the chapter. 
Uh, yes, Murray Rothbard shirt. Would, would you handle that the same way if it was, say, an accidental death? Oh, accidental. Um, yeah. See, uh, suppose I, um, if it was an accident, then it's a tort. It's not a crime. There's no mens rea. Look, if I uh, put a dent in your car with my car by accident, remember I, I gave you the four parts of libertarian punishment theory? Now only the first part applies. I would have to uh, make good the dent in your car. Or uh, I broke your TV, I sort of shoved it with my elbow, it fell on the floor, I have to give you my TV. But there's no second TV, there's no cost of search, there's no um, Russian roulette, there's no nothing. But suppose I'm cleaning my gun by accident, and I uh, shoot, I'll pick William again. I don't want to get everyone mad at me. I'm cleaning, I'm cleaning my gun and I shoot him. Well, now only the first of the four teeth of libertarianism applies. But still, his wife is um, bereft of his services. I owe a life. The tough one is, suppose my baby... Uh, two-year-old baby, uh, somehow I dropped the gun in his crib and, and he shot William. <laughs> well, does the baby owe the life? No, I owe the life because I'm the guardian of the baby. So this would be sort of more complicated issues. But the point is, there are only two, two choices. It's, it's me or his wife and kids. Who is more deserving of my life when I killed him by accident? So that's a, that's a harder, harder one to get through. But I think that's where the the law of libertarianism leads us. Roger, am I over time? You're over. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thanks for your attention.